right. Well, good. We got a quorum and forum here. So good afternoon, and thank you for attending the eighth cultural and area studies office session of the 2022-2023 academic year and the first of this calendar year in 2023. Today's panel discussion is sponsored by the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College's CASO team, as discussed earlier, in conjunction with the American Enterprise Institute and the Foreign Military Studies Office, TRADOC G2. The topic of today's session is trends and directions in a post-protest Iran. Some of you may be writing on this topic, which hopefully will en enrich your own research. Last year, in a periodic assessment of U.S. defense needs and priorities, the Pentagon highlighted threats beyond Russia and China to include Iran, North Korea, and violent extremist organizations. The assessment noted that Iran is taking actions that would improve its ability to produce a nuclear weapon should it make the decision to do so even as it builds and exports extensive missile forces, uncrewed, uncrewed aircraft systems, and advanced maritime capabilities that threaten choke points for the free flow of energy resources and international commerce. Iran, which in recent, recent months has been facing anti-government protests, primarily denies seeking a nuclear weapon. Diplomatic efforts between Tehran and Washington to restore the deal have stalled. The main question for today's discussion in support of U.S. and our partners' national security objectives is how do these events shape the potential threat from Iran and how should we address the possible prospects and outcomes in a post-protest Iran? One of the many key functions of Army University is to develop agile and adaptive leaders that can help solve operational and strategic level problems. Our CASO panels enhance our understanding of the quickly changing dynamics of regional and global geopolitics to arm our leaders a depth of knowledge that appreciates the complexity and nuances of such global issues. I encourage all those in attendance today to actively participate in the discussion and use the presented information and associated analysis and support, as I said before, your own research to enhance and expand your own knowledge. So thanks again for your interest in attendance today. I look forward to the tremendous discussion and learning. Educate to win. Thank you, sir, for your support. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our next CASO session. For many years, this is unusual not to see, like, standing room only. There must be something going on. We still have some seats available. But I know for sure they're uh, watching uh, online because we have CJC Facebook Live and VTC. So my name is Mahir Ibrahimo, mostly known as Dr. I as many of you already know by now, because we have conducted multiple, as uh, the general mentioned, uh, sessions already in this um, academic year. So I am director of the U.S. Army CJC's Cultural and Area Studies Office. Trying to stay relevant, we continue our usual approach, analyzing the operational environment and identifying important topics for our national security. Then, jointly with our many partners, we invite the best talents in their respective areas of expertise. No doubt that today's topic is very pertinent, and our guest speaker is one of the most prominent scholars on the region. CASO conducted its previous session on U.S.-Iran relations in 2020. Some of our faculty and staff might remember even attended then. Jointly with our another great partner, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. The panel was held right after the U.S. airstrike killed Iran's General Qasem Soleimani and analyzed the possible implications of the subsequent tension in bilateral relations. The video of the entire session is available on CASO website for anyone who desires to see it. 
Today's panel is the logical continuation of the Iran-related discussion based on the recent developments in the country. Several months of protests have wrecked Iran. Next slide, please. This map depicts the extent of the latest protests per regions of Iran with big red color legend indicating 100 or more protests, other colors indicating fewer numbers. You can clearly see the big numbers in the so-called, for example, Iranian Azerbaijan, uh, you know, there have been uh, multiple wars and uh, Azerbaijan kind of divided the so-called Iranian Azerbaijan, Eastern and Western Azerbaijan, which is part of Iran, and then former Soviet, Soviet Iran, now independent, pre previously been part of the Russian Empire. So, and the Kurdish areas, the biggest, uh, looks like, according to this map, biggest protest, 100 or more. Then other regions, you can see, going to further regions, uh, of Iran, you have fewer numbers. So, as you can see, the scale of the protests are not even close to the scale of the mass protests in Iran in 1978 79, for example, which brought together Iranians across many different social groups and had effectively overthrown the government of Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi Ilven. Does that make sense so far? Okay, today's session will draw upon the history of Iranian protests to explore government strategy, how protests might end, and examine how these protests differ from previous experiences. While the protests have challenged the regime, they still lack a cohesive leadership. Like the architect of the Islamic revolution in Iran, Ayatollah Ruhale Khomeini in 1979 revolution, which he orchestrated then in Paris, even being overseas. If leadership emerges, what, a, what might it look like? The discussion will explore how protests might impact the succession struggle after the aging supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei not to confuse Ayatollah Ruhale Khomeini, right? These are different people. And what might come next in Iran for the changing nature of leadership, political trends, the future role and fate of the Islamic Revolution God core. No doubt, what lies ahead for Iran, a country of 85 million, will have significant consequences internally and externally. Meanwhile, Iran ties with Russia are growing, and it is the closest it has ever been to reaching nuclear bomb making capability, getting closer to 90%. Reportedly, Iran's armament industry was preparing a shipment of Fateh 110 and Zulfigar missiles, two well known Iranian short range ballistic missiles capable of striking targets at distances of 300 and 700 kilometers which Russia might use in Ukraine. The US and Western officials identified specific Iranian drones, such as Shahed-136, Shahed means from Persian witness, not to confuse with Shahid, which is martyr, right? So uh, that uh, Tehran had supplied to Russia. Shahed-136 designed and manufactured by Iranian Shahed aviation industries, sometimes called kamikaze drones, because they are designed to crash into their targets, can deliver explosive payloads at distances of up to 1,500 miles. Iranian technical advisors have visited Russian control areas to provide instructions on operating the drones. Next slide, please. This map is an example of Russian attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure. You can see according to the legend, right? In the, like, uh, very active hostilities are going on in Kipians region of Ukraine, for those who have been to Ukraine before, and other areas, right? So, uh, so the target war, military and other targets by the Iranian drones, often repainted and rebranded as Russian 
Geran 2 drones, in Russian, Geran 2, right? So the main approach has been mostly under General Sergei Sirovikin, the previous overall command of Russian forces in Ukraine, to launch the wave of relatively cheap Iranian drones against Ukrainian targets. And after Ukrainian air defense systems would be activated and disclose their locations, Russians then would use their own KH-101 cruise missiles, sea-based caliber cruise missiles, 9K-720 Iskander, known in NATO as SS-26 Stone Short Range Ballistic Missile Systems, with a range of 500 kilometers, etc. So the Iranian drones have done some damage in Ukraine. These and other questions would be hopefully addressed during our session today, which is part of CASO's series of events, to address the challenges which the US and its partners are facing in different regions of the world. We are privileged to have our guest speaker, Dr. Michael Rubin, a senior fellow with the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, DC. He has previously worked as a lecturer in Iranian history at Yale University, Johns Hopkins University in Washington, DC, and at three different universities in Northern Iraq. He has lived and conducted research in Yemen, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and with the Taliban in Afghanistan pre-9-11. Rubin is an author of many publications. Dr. Rubin's complete bio can be accessed at CASO website. The opinion and discussion points during the session are those of the speaker and the moderator and do not represent the official position of the United States government. Before I yield the floor to our distinguished guest speaker, on behalf of CASO and its team, I would like to express our appreciation to the Foreign Military Studies Office, FIMSO, and its director, Mr. Tom Wilhelm, for the great partnership all these years in support of CASO mission, including Dr. Rubin's participation in today's session. <laughs> Next slide, please. So with this, I would like to yield the floor to Dr. Michael Rubin, who will speak for the rest of the first hour or so, followed by a questions, answers, comments session for the remaining time. Dr. Rubin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just to interpret what Dr. Ibrahimov just said is, if you like what I have to say, we should all be grateful to CASO for putting this together. But if you dislike what I have to say, the blame is on Tom Wilhelm from the Foreign Military Studies <laughs> Office. I also want to thank um, the general for having me here. Um, for those of you that don't know the Foreign Military Studies Office, it puts together uh, foreign language speakers to do translation and analysis of some of the stories that are, we believe to be important that don't necessarily make the Western press. And so I've had the honor to be following the Iranian drone development for well over a decade, looking at the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, papers and so forth. And it's all on the app, it's all unclassified on the APAN system. If you just look up FIMSO, it's a real treasure that you have here at Fort Leavenworth. So I want to thank um, everyone for making possible my time here today. Now, there's an old Russian joke about the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. The Russian pessimist is the one who says, you know, things are so bad right now. They couldn't possibly get worse. War, the economy, the environment, public health, it's just never been so bad. And the Russian optimist is the one who said, no, 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 it can always get worse. So today I'm going to speak on the Iran file as a bit of an optimist. Now, I'm a historian by training. And my critics would say that means I get paid to predict the past. And I only get that right about half the time. But my goal today is to look at how history informs us to look at some of the issues relating to the system, what's going on in Iran, and I'd argue some of the trends which might illustrate themselves through understanding the history of Iran as to what could possibly happen worse. 
I certainly don't have the crystal ball. But what I want to try to do is focus some attention both on the different directions in which Iran could go, and as important, oftentimes for consumers of intelligence, even though this is all at an unclassified level, but I used to work in um, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, don't worry, the biggest lesson I learned there was that PowerPoint is the work of Satan. So I'm not going to do that. But as consumers of intelligence, we tend to focus on what it says. Just as important is to understand the holes in the intelligence and to understand how what we don't know, even 40 plus years after the Islamic Revolution, can shape our policies moving forward. So next slide, please. Now, back when I was in graduate school doing Iranian studies, myself and the other guys and gals doing Iranian studies would sometimes go out for drinks on a Friday night, and we'd try to see who could name all the leaders of Iran going back 2,000 years. So Ali Khamenei, Rahula Khomeini, Mohammad Reza Shah, Reza Shah, Ahmed Shah, Muhammad Ali Shah, Muzaffar al-Din Shah. None of us got married till we were in our 30s, <laughs> believe it or not. The point of this, however, is that Iran has a near contiguous history that goes back more than 2,000 years. It would be a mistake only to start analysis of Iran and the Iranian problem set today with the Islamic Revolution in 1979. There has certainly been a protest movement in Iran that has, seems to have increased momentum over recent years, but there's also been a protest movement prior to the Islamic Revolution. And to understand and contextualize the protest movement today, it is important to understand some of the issues that arose from the protest movement back in the late 19th century. Now, I won't be the typical academic that talks only about my doctoral dissertation because, look, I know no one's ever read it straight through because, as I've said before, I put a $50 bill on page 17 in the library. Every reunion I go back, that $50 bill is still there. <laughs> At any rate, the point of this is what my dissertation was was about how telegraphy in the 19th century, the telegraph, helped enable the mass political movement. How prior to having a system of national communication, you had the occasional protests, but most were either local or they simply failed at the national level. Whereas after first you had the tele uh, telegraph, then leading up to the Islamic Revolution, you had the radio, you had the audio tape. Today you have the internet and so forth. How this has enabled the mass political movement. Communications matter. Now. Iranians have never hesitated to protest when they thought that their government was behaving badly or behaving in a way that fundamentally undercut the interests of the Iranian public, however you want to define the Iranian public. So in 1872, you had what became known as the Reuters concession. The same Reuters who, at the time, who would subsequently create the huge news agency. But Baron Julius de Reuter, or von Reuter, I forget the exact name, um, had wanted to have a concession, and a concession is basically just a business monopoly. No one else would be able to be involved in that business, and ordinary Iranians thought that the terms of those, that concession, when they learned about this, when it got published in newspapers, was extortionate and that it would, infect, it would affect them directly by, for example, um, confiscating lands on either side of a railroad which he was going to build, and these were lands that were coming from Iranian farmers and so forth, uh, for which they wouldn't receive adequate comp um, compensation and so forth. Long story short, there was mass protests, and eventually the government stood down. What's actually interesting was in 1891, 1892, you had what became known as the tobacco regi, or the tobacco protests, where basically a British firm got a monopoly over the production of tobacco, which was a major crop inside Iran. They were going to set the price. You had to sell the tobacco to a set institution. Uh, and of course, whenever you have any monopoly, it wasn't going to work out favorably towards the farmers. There is a protest. What made this so interesting, however, 
is that there is a religious component to the protest movement. So while Iran is largely Shiite, it's not, I mean, and Iran isn't entirely Shiite, we're going to go into that later. At the same time, Shiites don't all live in Iran. The largest or most important Shia theological centers are next door in what at the time was the Ottoman Empire, but today is Iraq. So specifically in Negev and in Karbala. And you had ayatollahs at the time there give religious edicts, which basically made it forbidden to smoke tobacco, which was, again, part and parcel of Iranian culture at the time. People would go out to coffee shops, they'd smoke. Um, but the call of the ayatollahs at that time had such great residence that even though the Shah wanted this, members of his own harem stopped smoking tobacco. And in the end, um, the British sort of and pulled back, but this was really the first, and, and the concession was canceled once again. Then you had 1905 to 1911. In 1905, um, those of you who know Russian history know about the first Russian Revolution that resulted in the creation of the Duma and, the, um, the, if you will, the check on the power of the Tsar by having at least some sort of parliamentary authority in St. Petersburg. That inspired that inspired the Iranians. And I'm just saying Iranians throughout. Officially, in 1935 was when they changed the name from Persia to Iran. But it's sort of like in Germany. If they officially said, call us Deutschland, it wouldn't make it a different country. So I'm just calling it Iran throughout. So the, there was an inspiration for this. And the Iranians demanded something similar. A lot of the protest movement was not only in Tehran, which was the capital of Iran, but also in Tabriz, the capital of Iranian Azerbaijan, which Dr. Ibrahimov referred to. And when you come to Tabriz, it's not, don't consider it a peripheral city, then or now. Historically, under the Iranian monarchy, it was the site where the crown prince would always be the governor. So arguably, it was the second most important city in Iran after the capital, Tehran. And um, it was once, Tabriz was also at one point in Iranian history, the capital of Iran itself. So finally, after months of year, I mean months of agitation, this was really the first time that the Iranian revolution, because of telegraphy, it was being reported on an almost daily basis in newspapers, especially in London, also in Moscow. Finally, the Shah caved. And he agreed that there would be a majlis, a, basically a parliament. And I'm going to get back to why this is important uh, to today's protests. Now, unfortunately for him, about a week after he signed this agreement, the basic law, the Constitution, he died. That really annoyed the crown prince, because the crown prince was looking forward to the absolute rule, which everyone before him had enjoyed. And just a week before his succession, his, his father signed away a lot of his power. And this led to um, great, I mean, at the time you had the great game, which I'd argue was, I mean, basically the 19th century predecessor of the Cold War. The, the, the struggle for strategic mastery across Asia between the Russians, the British, and then, and then later in the 19th century, the Germans as well. And so you had the Russians sort of help support the, the new Shah, Muhammad Ali Shah, whereas the constitutionalists had the sympathy or the support, to some extent, of the British. And this, I mean, on one hand, why this is important today is because whereas, for example, critics of the American political or diplomatic policy in Iraq after Operation Iraqi Freedom would say 
it was naive to try to create a democracy in a country like Iraq because it wasn't indigenous to Iraq. Let's put that debate aside for a second. Uh, actually, let's put that debate aside for the length of the panel. When it comes to Iran, the Iranians will look at this period in the first decade of the 20th century as showing that there is actually an indigenous example of some sort of democracy inside Iran. This is before the Shah, post-1950s, became as autocratic as he came. There was actually a period where you had a constitutional uh, monarchy, if you will, a very weak one, but enough for a precedent. At the same time, many Iranians will look back at this, and this is really part of the core, if not the core, of the suspicion that on a very popular level, ordinary Iranians have towards the Russians, that the Russians are always trying to exploit them. Indeed, the whole reason why the Iranians turned to the Americans shortly after this point in time was to try to extricate themselves from the debt diplomacy that both the Russians and the British had engaged them in. They saw the Americans as disinterested in politics, disinterested in uh, a neutral party. Of course, with time and with the Cold War, we proved them wrong. But at the time, you had that dynamic going on. And by the way, this dynamic now plays into the Iranian sort of tilt, if you will, towards China, as they're always looking for a party which is strong enough to stand up to those parties they see as exploitive, but at the same time they hope will stay out of their domestic politics. So, you had other sort of revolutions, more local, some political, but the big one that is the cause of, that, that overthrew the Shah was what happened in 1979, actually started years before. Now one thing, I, I say this as an academic, I want to put a cautionary, cautionary note on. When it comes to the books that have been written about the Islamic Republic, it's important to understand the origin of those books. Think in your own lifetimes about the Arab Spring just 12 years ago. When the Arab Spring happened, it surprised almost everyone. And most of the people who said that it didn't surprise them, they knew it was coming all along, are dirty, stinking liars. But when the Arab Spring happened, and it surprised them, you had a lot of publishers go to academics to say, explain this. We, we want to commission a book. Get it out as fast as you can. And a lot of the academics, therefore, wrote books which explained why we all should have seen the Arab Spring coming. It was the natural outcome of the dynamics at the time. The same thing is true when we look at the Islamic Revolution. People didn't really see it coming. But after it happened, hindsight is always 2020, and a lot of academics, Nikki Ketty, for example, who wrote Roots of Revolution, or Irvand Abrahamian, who wrote Iran Between Two Revolutions, argued that this was the natural pinnacle of Iran's political evolution. I, I mean, maybe you believe that, and those books remain with updated versions, the core of what many people in the US government read today to learn about Iran. I would argue that the Islamic Revolution, there's a lot of luck associated with it. A lot of moving parts that didn't need to end up where they ended up, but that it's not necessarily the, the, um, the apex of Iranian political revolution. The question then becomes, is the Islamic Republic a natural outcome which has permanence, or is it really an anomaly which ultimately is unstable and can be reversed? And this is what we see playing out right now. So I'll come back to that a little bit, but one thing I want to point out, and this is important for understanding the protest movement today, I would argue that what the pro bottom line up front, the protest movement today has completely delegi delegitimized and permanently delegitimized the Islamic Republic. They no longer have a claim to popular legitimacy, which they once tried to make. At the same time, that is very, very different 
from suggesting that they will end the regime. There are many different zombie regimes out there which have lost popular legitimacy but yet continue to power on because they're very good at maintaining security, at intimidating, or simply there's inertia to any sort of change. I remember when I went to Kandahar under Taliban control in, the, in March of 2000, and I was interviewing people down there. When the Taliban came in and took Kabul in 1996, they like to say, I mean, they claim some popular legitimacy because people were so sick and tired of the warlords. At least we have stability now. And when I interviewed people, they said, look, that may have been true for a little bit, but now they're just as bad as the groups that came before. There's different factions within the Taliban. They're being exploitive. They're attacking people on the streets. Um, we no longer look at them the same way. And I was actually, I remember talking to some women and what they had said, this was near Mullah Omar's house in Kandahar at the time, that if 500 of us stood in this square and all took off our chadors, our niqabs, the regime would come crumbling down. And I said, why don't you do it? And they said, no one wants to be the 100 women who are killed doing it. I mean, it's not all about popular legitimacy. Oftentimes, it's the guys with the guns that matter. So that, that's just a cautionary note. The other cautionary note I want to say is that when the revolution happened in 1979, Ayatollah, I mean, it was amazing from a historical standpoint, especially before the age of social media, because you had a full 10% of the country take part. Historians estimate that only 1% of Americans took part in our revolution back in the 18th century, and only 2% of Russians or, or Frenchmen took part in, respectively, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution or a matter of chronological order, the, the French Revolution. 10% is an amazing figure. Ayatollah Khomeini achieved this by telling people what he, uniting people in what he was against, against the Shah. He was very circumspect about what he was for. He was for an Islamic democracy. What does that mean? No one knows. At the same time, he would give interviews. I'm not interested in personal power, he told, I think, um, Associated Press. Um, well, that's all well and good until the revolution happened. Now, I was in Iran during the 1999 student protests. Um, that's when I was doing my PhD work in the Iranian archives. I went in first in 1996, then I went back in 1999. They used to call me Pasari Shaitani Bozorg. If any of you are Persian speakers, it means son of the great Satan. At any rate, um, in 1999, you had Mohammad Khatami, who was supposed to be a quote-unquote reformist. Bottom line up front, I look at any of the elected Iranian offices as window dressing, as an elaborate game of good cop, bad cop. All the real policy is determined by the unelected bureaucracy that descends from the supreme leader himself, and that includes all the security forces. This, what happened, students um, were protesting the closure of a newspaper, um, peaceful protests. They went back to their dorm. That night, their dorm was attacked by plainclothes security forces. Uh, they actually defenestrated some students. Don't often get to use that term unless you're talking about Prague. They defenestrated some students in the center of uh, Tehran. And the, whack, uh, the smashing heads led to a reaction that led to the largest demonstrations in Iran in more than 20 years, nationwide demonstrations. Then in 2001, you had a diaspora, Persian language broadcast from Los Angeles. At the back, right after Iran lost three to one in a World Cup qualifier to lowly Bahrain, they said that they had information and it was probably absolute nonsense. The, this diaspora channel that the Iranian government ordered the team to throw the match so that men and women wouldn't dance together in the street. Absolute outrage. People came out to protest. Then, of course, in 2009, you had the post-election unrest. Now, I'm not being flippant when I say this because I think it's part and parcel of Iran's strategy now. When did those protests end? Those protests ended 
when Michael Jackson died because the Western news cycle moved on. The question I have, and it's an open question, is right now, are the Iranians counting on the fact that if they can only hold on long enough with the security forces, eventually there will be some headline. The Americans are known to be notoriously to have um, national attention deficit disorder, not just culturally, but also when it comes to national security. And therefore, can the Iranians outweigh us? Outweigh us? When I used to teach um, as a TA for Paul Kennedy, American political history, or political history, I should say, um, diplomatic history at Yale. I mean, again, just as a grad student TA, not as my own course at that time. One of my ice-breaking questions is, what's your earliest political memory? And my students couldn't go back more than 10 years. That was their history. Where did you come from? Most of them were coming from 1,000 miles away. In this part of the world, it's different. Your earliest political memory is 1,000 years ago, but you wouldn't think, you wouldn't even consider moving 10 miles away often. So different perspectives, can they outlast us? Remember, multiculturalism isn't just about appreciating our differences. It's not about walking into a sushi bar and ordering a mojito. It's fundamentally about different people thinking in very, very different ways. So anyway, election protests. We've had, one thing I want you to notice as we go to the economic protests, which actually started, um, I think, December 27th, 2017, I just put 2018 for the neatness of the slide. Then we had the water protests in, once the river in Isfahan ran dry. And by the way, that, that's both environmental, but there's also an element that goes beyond what we would think in terms of our own climate change protests that um, are so common on college campuses and so forth here. Why did the water run dry in Isfahan? Uh, and this is a city in which I used to live when I was studying Persian. The answer was because the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps was get, getting contracts, single source, no bid contracts, and you can read about this in the Foreign Military Studies Office publications. In order to basically divert money to them, they were building unnecessary dams. The dams called the water, um, caused the river to run dry, so environmental protests also have an element of anti-Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, anti-regime, anti-corruption protests to them as well. And then most recently we have the protests that started not just with a woman who um, wasn't dressed properly according to morality police. What's actually interesting here, not just a woman, a Kurdish woman, a Sunni Muslim Kurdish woman. And what this, why this is important in the current dynamics is while Dr. Imrahimov said that these aren't like the 1979 protests, what makes these different from some of the protests that have happened in the years since 1979 is you really have ordinary Persian nationalists, including in the capital Tehran, joining in with what might otherwise have been marginalized just as a minority, a sectarian and an ethnic minority issue. Next slide, please. So, can the protests succeed? Again, bottom line up front, the reason why I'm optimistic in the old Soviet sense is I don't see any common platform. It's all well and good to argue what you are against, but is this a case of herding cats? when it comes to trying to unify people around any particular figure or any particular platform. Masa Amini, who was the woman around whom people rallied, is dead. She's a martyr. She's not someone living to whom people can, can rally around. There are some people outside the country, but Iran is a huge bureaucracy. Even in the peripheral areas, I mean, Iran used to use voter, um, voter turnout as a sign of their legitimacy, and I fully agree with Dr. Ibrahimov. You can't, I, I mean, I've always found it ironic that in the United States, on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC, whatever your flavor is, you have talking heads who will go over minutiae of what the political polls or the exit polls mean and say and whether we should believe this or believe that, and yet, as a country, our, we're so often willing to take at face value the statistics which are provided by Iran, by China, by Russia, what have you. So just a cautionary note on that. 
when I talk to Iranians, especially in the Kurdish areas, what they will say is they have to vote in order to qualify and keep their civil service jobs. What they will often do is, and they will get their national ID stamped, even though that's not an official process, to show, to prove that they voted. And then they will spoil their ballot. So number one, the issue isn't voter turnout. It's number of spoiled ballots you need to look at. Second of all, most of our journalists, when they go, sit from Tehran. And specifically, they sit from northern Tehran, from the Everdon. That's like opining on what's going on in Leavenworth, Kansas, from the upper west side of Manhattan. So again, some cautionary notes on just understanding Iran. But I don't see any particular figure here. Now, what don't we know? Within our intelligence, one of the big factors would be, I, I mean, I would argue, and this is one of the reasons why I always oppose this notion that we could have reformism, the Mahmoud Khatami model, triumph in Iran. Because the, the difference between the Iranian army and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is the Iranian army is charged with territorial defense. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is charged with defense of the revolution, which means the enemies could be external or they could be internal. Now, we always talk about hardline, and they exist basically as a Praetorian Guard. You're not going to have reform, muddle through reform if these guys are going to prevent it. Now, a few things we don't know about the Revolutionary Guard. We always talk, and you've probably heard, People talk about hardliners versus reformers when it comes to Iranian politics. The, by the way, in Persian, you don't use the term hardliner. You use the term that translates to principalist, those who abide by the principles of the revolution. It's an important distinction, which I can get into offline. At any rate, we assign, we say, that guy's a hardliner, that guy's a reformer. Personally, I see it as good cop, bad cop, but put that debate aside. Within the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, what are the factional divisions? The Islamic Revolution happened, we're coming up on 44 years ago. 44 years ago. What is the factional division within the Revolutionary Guard? Now, Rand Corporation, at an unclassified level, has done some speculation about this faction or that faction. One thing we could, but we, we don't know enough to say this person belongs to this faction, that person belongs to that faction. Now, at the same time, in 2007, Saddam Hussein was dead. The Taliban were, being pu were pushed back. The Israelis were a paper tiger. And I'm quoting the Revolutionary Guard now. The Americans can't do a damn thing. That's the slogan they would use. Therefore, the biggest threat to the regime would come from inside Iran rather than outside Iran. So what they decided to do was rearrange the Revolutionary Guard to put one unit in every Iranian province, two in Tehran, because Tehran is so big. The question then becomes, and this is an, also an unknown, are the units, the provincial units of the Revolutionary Guard, staffed by natives of the provinces in which they serve? The answer to that indicates whether ideology trumps kinship if given the order to fire on the crowds in the street. And again, we don't have a sense of that. We know that the guard isn't homogenous. And Iran is a conscript society. If you're going to be conscripted, you might as well join the Revolutionary Guard. You get additional, additional privileges. You have, and again, no moral equivalence here, you get better benefits than the Iranian equivalent to the GI Bill. You get more rationed gasoline and so forth. So you have that. But at the same time, you can go into the Revolutionary Guard bubble when you're about eight or nine years old. They run the equivalent of evil Boy Scout after school programs. And they run universities. Again, in Foreign Military Studies Office publications, we've talked about the, revolution, um, the universities which the Revolutionary Guard run. And so if you go in when you're eight years old, are you indoctrinated? One of the reasons why the former president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, had gained so much analytical attention wasn't just because he was such a colorful figure with his Holocaust denial and all of that uh, and threatening to burn the world and, and that sort of thing. It was because he was the first president who came from a Revolutionary Guard background and therefore he was seen as a window 
into the thinking of ordinary revolutionary guardsmen. So um, we've talked about could the Revolutionary Guards fracture? Um, could, is there any unity to the protest movement? Who opposes change? And this is one thing that also, I mean, you can see parallels to here perhaps with our experience in Iraq. And again, without going to the polemics, just analytically. There's a large debate with regard to this notion of debothification about extricating or banning uh, office holders who were in the highest tiers of the Ba'ath Party, but at the same time, the Iraqis or some Iraqis got a little bit enthusiastic and used it to purge even more people. Iran is a huge bureaucracy. I mean, being a civil servant, it, it's like Cuba it's, or Iraqi Kurdistan. It's, I think, more than 70% of the people are on the government payroll. So if you have external operators, the, former, uh, the son of the former Shah, for example, or um, I'm forgetting her name, but the woman journalist um, who was famously, they tried to kidnap her, ship her to Venezuela from New York, from Brooklyn. Um, those are external people. What are, if you're a bureaucrat, if your main goal is to feed your family, are you going to feed your family if you worry that you're going to get purged in your job? Is there any consensus from Iranians outside Iran who I would argue oftentimes are in groups, they're just 40 men in a newspaper who have delusions of grandeur, 40 generals for every private, versus some of the people inside. How do you capture the civil society? How do you convince them that the change isn't going to hurt them? Um, is there, um, where does the bureaucracy stand? One thing I've noticed and I've tried to point out in my more um, populist, uh, my op-ed writing as opposed to my academic writing is, look, from doing my PhD research in the foreign ministry archives back in the late 1990s, I know a bunch of Iranian diplomats, including some who have risen up to deputy minister levels. I haven't seen a single Iranian diplomat, even a so-called reformist, defect. Defect from um, in, with the disgust of what they have seen inside Iran. Now, that doesn't mean they're not aware. Popular opinion is certainly against the regime. And by the way, just as an aside, popular opinion is against Iran's position on Russia as well. In talking to Iranians who went back after Iran abstained in the UN vote um, back in March of 2022 condemning Russia, People, ordinary Iranians gave returnees, especially returnees affiliated with the Iranian government, an earful. How dare you not side with Ukraine when, when Iraq invaded us in 1980, no one sided with us. We are the Ukrainians. So there is this discrepancy between the public opinion and the official position. But again, guys with the guns that matter. Next slide, please. So let's look at how Iranians organize. Now, when I used to be a desk officer in Office of Secretary of Defense, the two things I would always try to shut down is, and, and you can disagree with me on this, but it is what it is, I would always try to shut down any sort of involvement with the Mujahideen al-Haq, which I don't see as, I mean, put it this way, whether you want to label it a terrorist organization, a cult, or a democratic organization, the way Iranians look at it is the way they would look at John Walker Lind or Bo Bergdahl. They look at it as someone who, in their hour of need, made very wrong decisions. In the case of the Mujahideen al-Haq, it was siding with Saddam Hussein after they were purged. So the reason why I always counsel people to avoid the Mujahideen al-Haq is it rallies people around the flag, and that's something which the regime takes advantage of. The other thing I always try to caution people about is any sort of belief that we should play an ethnic card in Iran. Iran is an ethnic, uh, diverse country. Only, it used to be about 50%. Now it's probably closer to 60% of the country is Persian. The rest is of religious uh, sorry, of ethnic minorities. But this doesn't mean that 
the ethnic minorities are necessarily separatist because Iran as an identity predates this notion, this 19th century notion of organizing states around ethno-nationalist groups. So Germany and Italy may have formed around Germans and Italians. The, um, France among the French, and we can look at various issues. Um, if you want to look down in Nigeria, even though it was a failed movement, the Biafran move movement with regard to the Igbo and so forth. In Iran, I wouldn't necessarily say that you have a parallel there. And remember, the supreme leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, what's his ethnicity? He's Azeri. He's not Persian. So, I mean, just as one example, the former head of the judiciary, Muhammad um, Shahrudi, was actually an Arab, not a Persian, and so forth. And so if Iranians feel that you're trying to take apart their country, they're going to rally around the flag. I would argue that what the Iranian regime fears most are the bullet points you see up on the screen, the labor movement. During the Bush administration, I would argue that we lost our biggest opportunity. And again, I say this as someone who was on the Iran desk at the time, so I'm not just being an outside critic. When we didn't recognize the labor movement for what it was, there are only two countries in the Middle East that have an independent, non-government controlled labor movement in the country. One is Israel. The other is Iran. That wasn't always the case. They, the Iranians had their lequalensa moment, their solidarity moment, with Mansour Osanlu and the bus drivers back in 2005. And again, as with the environmental movement, there's, there's a tweak here. Because the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, after the end of the Iran-Iraq War, they didn't want to lose their power. They didn't want to simply go back into the barracks. So without moral equivalence, they went in, they took their equivalent of the Army Corps of Engineers and went into the civilian economy. Today, if you want to understand what the economic wing of the Revolutionary Guard is like, imagine taking, again, no equivalence here, taking the Army Corps of Engineers, merging it with KBR, Halliburton, Bechtel, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Walmart, ExxonMobil, and Shell. That's what you would get. They control about 40% of the economy. So who controls a lot of the factories? The Revolutionary Guard. And the Revolutionary Guard oftentimes, and by the way, if the re official budget of the Revolutionary Guard is around $8 billion, and again, cautionary note with regard to what the um, actual figures are, $8 billion, according to, I think, the um, Congressional Research Service. Then you add another $13 billion in the smuggling income across the Persian Gulf. That's not, uh, and I've, I've been with those smugglers in the Strait of Hormuz. They're good, honest, hardworking, apolitical smugglers. They don't particularly like the Islamic Revolution and the Islamic Republic. But in order to fuel up, they have to pay 400% markups because the IRGC has, has subsidized fuel but doesn't give them the subsidies. And they also have to pay docking fees at the so-called invisible jetties. Then if you actually look, and we do this at the Foreign Military Studies Office, at the Persian language sources, no bid contracts. In some years, you can get up to $50 billion awarded by the state to Revolutionary Guard controlled companies, which means in, in some cases, if the Iranian parliament was going to have an epiphany and say that we realize that the Revolutionary Guard is a terrorist group and we're going to take their budget to zero, they'd be facing basically proportionately the same sort of cutback that we faced during sequestration. Most of their budget is off books. And so they don't depend on the official government to fund them. They believe that they're above the law, and therefore they often don't pay back wages or have unsafe working conditions. And this is why the bus drivers struck. This is why other factory workers have struck. This is why you sometimes see union activists marching with signs in Tehran, forget about Palestine, and think about us. So you have the labor thing. You have the environment, and we already talked about the water issue, and in the back you see Asula, which is one of the biggest polluted areas near where the Iranians have a major refinery. And then we most recently have the water issue. Uh, sorry, the women issue. What makes, uh, what's similar between all of these? They're all movements that can unite Iranians across socioeconomic class, across ethnicity, 
and across religion. This is why you see the Iranians, the government, and for that matter, you see them going after activists from these organizations or these demographic subgroups, the women. Or you see them going after sports stars because they're afraid of anyone who could become a symbol. And this long predates the current sort of protest movement we have now. Next slide, please. What, if the revolution government does fall, what models are out there? The monarchy. Don't, I mean, being in the United States, we might have a, a cynical view of monarchs. After all, we freed, I mean, we may see them as a historic uh, throwback to the past. I wouldn't believe that in the case of Iran. But that doesn't mean that the crown prince, Reza Pahlavi, is going to come back. What I would say, both when I lived in Iran and then subsequently when I've seen Iranians who weren't expecting to meet him, meet the crown prince of Iran, the former crown prince, is that there's a sense that the grass is always greener. When it comes to the personality of Reza Pahlavi, though, he recognizes his father was a dictator and that his father was involved in significant human rights violations. And he, he's bending over backwards the other way in a manner so that he can't be accused of the same thing his father does. So could he be a figure in some future constitutional convention? Perhaps. But do I see him re coming back to the throne? I don't, I'm not so sure. At the same time, is he extremely popular in Iran? I'd argue yes, but whether he's popular on his own merits or popular because people look at, one, one example, I remember being in Isfahan, practicing my Persian in the market there. Someone was coming through selling bananas and they were small and they were moldy. And the storekeeper I was chatting with, uh, having tea with said, oh my Shah, my Shah, back when I was a boy, the bananas were like this and they only cost one tenth the price. You have that sort of dynamic. What about federalism versus central control? Here you have a number of different issues. Tehran, I mean, federalism, if you have different provinces and you have different ethnic groups, could you have the Kurds go free? Could you have the Azeris create their own sort of statelet? Could you have a model, for lack of a better example, of something like Ethiopia, which actually does have an ethnic federal model to it? And look where that's left Ethiopia today when it comes to the Tigray, when it comes to the Oromia, and so forth. What about the historical, if you will, stigma of federalism? What was the first crisis of the Cold War? It was, and I'll be wrapping up soon, um, the first crisis of the Cold War, it was the Azerbaijan crisis, where the Soviets refused to withdraw. So if you're going to try to go in your own ethnic provincial way? Does that have the stink of foreign influence? Are you going to be accused of that, uh, of being in the service of foreigners? The same thing goes with the Kurds. The same thing goes with the Baluch. The same thing goes with the Arabs. At the same time, if you, what about central control? If you have central control, what happens along the periphery? Constitutional Republic, you already have some sort of precedent for this. Liberal democracy, look, that's what I would wish for Iran. But then this goes back into the issue of the Revolutionary Guard. If they have 40% of the Iranian economy, tens of billions of dollars, if the supreme leader's own financial network is worth over, according to many estimates, $100 billion, what's going to happen to these guys? If you are a Revolutionary Guardsman, if you're the head of the Revolutionary Guard, are you going to willingly give up your wealth and your power and your access to resources. This brings us to the sort of next slide, the messiness of succession. What We haven't had a succession in Iran in more than 33 years. You see in the background the funeral of Ayatollah Khomeini. It was actually a heat wave going on during his funeral on June 6, 1989. The quip on the streets of Tehran was, um, the man was so senile he forgot to close the door on the way down. At any way, way you, Khomeini had appointed Khomeini, the current supreme leader, who's now, what, 83 years old. He's a cancer survivor. 
He's partially paralyzed from an assassination attempt. Even if he's, I don't want to be one of these think tank guys like with Hafez al-Assad who predicted for 30 years that he's going to die and when he died said, you know, I was right all along. But the fact of the matter is octogenarian ayatollahs don't have a long lifespan. So what, what makes this protest movement different is you have a delegitimization of Iran at the time where you could also have a vacancy, a void at the top. Now, number one, first transition in 33 years. Khamenei was, was a compromise candidate. But do you have another compromise candidate? You didn't have all these multi-billion dollar empires back then because the Iran-Iraq war had depleted everyone's reserves. So you have that problem. Then you have everyone who we haven't even imagined. If you only have one transition every 33 years, and being on top can mean sitting on top a hundred billion dollar empire, are you gonna just take, I mean, are you gonna play the lottery and look, if worse comes to worse, you end up in Qatar, you end up in Dubai, you end up in Venezuela or Moscow. I mean, could we actually see a civil war? Now, I'll get to the one, just one little side note before we get to the civil war scenario. We think of the supreme leader, first you had Khomeini, then you have Khamenei. There's nowhere in the Iranian constitution that says you have to have a single supreme leader. You can have a council of leadership. And if you have a council of leadership, what's that gonna do to the political dynamics? When Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden was killed, you had Zawahiri being appointed next, but then you had all the regional wannabes uh, in Yemen, in Algeria, in Pakistan, all of whom sought to stage tremendous attacks in order to um, prove their mettle. Could you have a dynamic like that when it comes to Iran's supreme leadership if you have a council? Now, one thing which uh, has been brought to my attention by some of the intelligence services, the Arab intelligence services in the region, because of course, this is their biggest problem set. When, for example, two years ago, Sultan Qaboos died, in Oman. For reasons that may be obvious to any of you who follow Gulf politics, but aren't politically correct to say here, he didn't have any children. So according to the Omani law, within 48 hours, there had to be a new, there, a, a council would form, and there, they had to choose a new uh, sultan. And they chose, I guess, his cousin Haitham. Now Iran, by the law, has a process. You have an assembly of experts. It chooses someone, um, by basically, who becomes the new supreme leader. Nowhere does it actually, in the Iranian constitution, attach a timeline to that process. So if you're the Revolutionary Guard, are you going to prevent the assembly of experts from actually coming to an agreement? And I think now it's got 88 members. Do they even matter? Because what we found out in 1989 when Khomeini died is they're basically a coffee clutch where you had this consensus and this politicking behind the scenes. Now, civil war. What happens in a civil war? I would argue, um, next slide please, um, that if you have a transition in Iran, the supreme leader dies, the first thing that will happen is you will have many of the provincial units are going to prioritize securing Tehran over securing Sanandaj or Mahabad or Zahadan or any of these peripheral cities. Now, every time you've had a weak leadership or a serious transition inside Iran uh, where the transition was uncertain, going back to Ubaidullah in the 1880s, a Kurdish tribal leader, um, then you had um, during the Constitutional Revolution, you had the British intervene, and you had the Russians intervene. You had um, World War I, you had Gilan's uprising, you had Mahabad in Azerbaijan, uh, the Kurdish Republic in Azerbaijan back in 1946. You had 19, um, the Islamic Revolution where again the Kurdish areas became a bloodbath. You have the vacuum along the periphery. What makes this different this time? Could it be that you have um, states surrounding Iran, which all have an interest and are going to interfere. You have the Pakistanis who might interfere in Baluchistan. 
you have the Azeris from the independent Republic of Azerbaijan who might intervene in what they politically, if not military, probably politically, in what they see as southern Azerbaijan. Turkey, of course, um, has ha um, been asserting its influence throughout the region, and it would be naive to believe that they wouldn't do so in Iran. If you're from, coming from a Turkish perspective, they might say, well, the Americans do the same thing, and you know what? We do. And the Israelis might do something. I mean, you have any of these regional powers. Now, whenever you have a situation like this, think Syria. Once you have multiple states supporting multiple political parties or perhaps local militias, then it can be very, very hard to restore stability. So when it comes to the reg regional outlook, one thing I always say when I'm teaching is, look, when I'm trying to get my students to think, imagine what the world would be like, U.S. policy would be like, if the regimes of Saudi Arabia or Jordan became hostile. And imagine what would happen if you had a civil war in Iran. I mean, this is something which I think is a very, very real possibility. Next slide. I think that's basically it. Um, so with that, I conclude. I hope I've been provocative. That's been my point here to raise more questions. Certainly, I don't have the answers. What I would actually argue as an area studies expert and someone who's been working for 30 years, anyone who does say that they have the answer is either arrogant or foolish. If there was a magic formula to our policy, we would have discovered it already. And the fact of the matter is, there's not. So with that, what I'd like to do is turn the floor back over to Dr. Ibrahimov, Dr. I, uh, so that we can have some Q&A and some discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ruben, for the great presentation, as was expected. Uh, before we get to the most engaging phase of our session, Q&A, questions, answers, and comments, just a, a couple of uh, comments in the support of the great presentation because we have not just the special as military personnel, but the uh, general purpose force as well, for those who are not very familiar with the region. So, uh, several things were mentioned, Mullah Omar. Mullah Omar was the spiritual, is still spiritual leader of the Taliban. He actually created the Taliban. So, and uh, he was killed in 2013 by the USA strike. So that's one point, which uh, Dr. Rubin mentioned. So now, the sen po second point is uh, about Tabriz. Uh, and somebody can ask what the Baku vis-a-vis -vis Tabriz. So just to remind uh, our audiences that there have been multiple uh, wars between the Russian Empire and the Persian Empire. As a result of those wars, two agreements were signed between the Russian Empire and the Persian Empire. <coughs> By the name of the geographical uh, places, the so-called Gulistan Agreement and Turkmenchai Agreements, 1824 and 1828. As a result, what you have now effectively between 20, 30 million ethnic Azeris living in the northern provinces of, uh, of Iran. If you can very quickly display that, uh, the map which I had before, I can show it. Uh, yeah. So you can see these areas, the so-called East Azerbaijan, West Azerbaijan, right? So they are adjacent to the former Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan, which used to be part of the Russian Empire. Upon the demise of the USSR, the former Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan, somewhere here, became independent. If, if you can imagine, with only 10 million people, compared to 20, 30 million people. And you can see, apparently, many of the latest protests, one of the main uh, protests were in that area as well. So the Iranian leadership very concerned and sensitive as the former Soviet Azerbaijan, now independent Azerbaijan, getting stronger, particularly after the Second Karabakh War. So uh, that was another point. Dr. Rubin also mentioned about, for example, Nikki Kedi, right? So uh, uh, when I just came back from, my, uh, from the Soviet military I used to serve in 100 years ago, uh, so, uh, I, we didn't know. My first culture when training was as a cadet in the Soviet military. And we did not know 
that the Soviets were planning to invade Afghanistan. We had no idea as the young cadets. So anyways, several years after that, uh, three things happened. And I was a young man, as a young scholar, started to be interested in that region. Three things happened. In 79, actually 78, 79, when the students started to protest, first in Tehran universities and others, then it spread over. And 79, Khomeini came from Paris to Tehran with millions of people greeting him, tea, with tears, etc. Now, that was one factor, but that was not the only one. Then there was a second factor, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, when Rustam Nusulbekov, with his small uh, uh, Spetsnaz force went to Kabul and killed everybody in that uh, palace of uh, Hafizullah Amin. So after that, uh, the big Soviet force came in. That was the second factor. And the third factor, uh, as a result of the Islamic revolution, and again, as a result of this invasion, activation of Islamic organizations around the globe and uh, uh, beginning of the Mujahideen movement within Afghanistan against the Soviets. It was military and geopolitical trap. So these three factors uh, what was, was uh, called by the scholars at that time, including Nikki Kedi, Janssen, Dekmejan, Yap, as the so-called Islamic revivalism. So Dr. Rubin probably familiar. That was the 70s, 80s. Three factors. So, uh, particularly, Janssen, one of the leading Western scholars, had a small brochure which divided those leaders, Islamic leaders, into those who believed honestly, sincerely in God and were trying to implement, execute their beliefs, and Khomeini was one of them, and they considered that one of the most dangerous. Second uh, category of the Islamic leaders were those who were kind of exploring those ideas, but don't, didn't really believe in those religious principles. And the third category was who actually were mixed, partially believing, partially not. So Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini was the sincere believer. Anwar Sadat, as an example of Egypt, was another category. And Qaddafi, with his green books, you remember the green books, he was talking about Arab socialism, giving the examples about that apple, etc., was another category. So I just wanted to support Dr. Rubin's points, just you familiar with what's really going on. Um, and uh, uh, when I, I, I was seeing, witnessing returning Spetsnaz members closer to 89, when the Soviets completely withdrew from Afghanistan, seeing those without uh, uh, limbs, etc., uh, the Spetsnaz members, I, I realized that was a devastating defeat, geopolitical and military. Um, so that was interesting, uh, interesting uh, experience. And the first Karabakh war, then uh, Yugoslavia situation was very casualties was the same level mostly, which we're witnessing now uh, in Ukraine, for example. So um, I just wanted to cl clarify all this for our wider audiences because not everybody they might be aware of those nuances which have been taking place historically and currently in the region and globally. Now, the, the floor is open for the outstations and this room. So, um, questions? Okay. So we'll begin with the Arnold. And then we'll go to the Facebook Live. Um, now, we might have the questions from VTC. Of course, they would, can ask the questions directly. But from Facebook Live, uh, when we go to the questions or comments, uh, Mr. Sals, our public affairs office, will be reading them. Uh, apparently, from VTC, they can directly ask those questions. So we will begin from this, uh, from this room, from the Arnold. Who has the first question? To our distinguished, distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Rubin, please clearly raise your hand. Identify yourself, sir. You are the first. Please. It's okay. You can begin, and then we we'll go next to the next. Uh. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your comments, uh, Ibn Shaitan, uh, uh, as son of the devil. Um, so, the uh, looking at the construct of the government and Mahsa meeting, 
being really the catalyst of the protests. Um, it's interesting you say about the, the exposure to Western press. I said women, life, freedom um, on social media once, and someone said, what does that mean? So I don't know if that really has penetrated. Um, they know that, that there are protests. But if that's the catalyst to these protests, uh, is it really that the people are upset largely by the incompetence of the government, the ability to not have a stable economy or to have water uh, and irrigation problems and food production problems and uh, an irresponsible government? Is, is that a bigger issue? And, and if it is, can we point to just one responsible party for the construct of the government? Or is this very widespread? Is it a stable uh, control? Or is it, is it, uh, is it fragile? OK, um, excellent question. What I'm going to actually do is re summarize and repeat the question uh, for those who are recording. But um, basically what you said, sir, um, was that we had at the outset um, Masa Amini, the slogan, Women, Life, Freedom, that sometimes it seems that that slogan is more popular um, outside than inside. And when we actually look at what's going on inside, that is there any sort of one factor, one institute or one person that seems to be responsible for the dire situation, or the complaints, against whom the complaints of the Iranians gravitate. You said it much more eloquently than I'm repeating it. Um, with regard to um, everything that's going on. And I would argue, first of all, it's a great question. Uh, second of all, the common thread is corruption. When it comes to arresting someone um, on for having bad hijab, um, showing too much hair, or um, in the case of Masa Amini, it was actually her, her blue jeans were considered to be too tight. Um, what actually happens, because I, I saw some of, I, I mean, I saw some of these checkpoints when I lived in Tehran. I was warned about them if something had been set up as I was walking to public transportation and so forth. Uh, the women I was walking with, who were also students, would be warned, get your hijab in order, that sort of thing, uh, by people whispering under their breath as they walked up the street. Um, when they arrest you, if they can force you into their vehicle, into their van, it becomes a shakedown. And so this is where the, the dress code morphs into corruption. If they can get you, instead of just slapping your wrist, or if you can't get away, you actually get pushed into their van, then you go to the police station, and then usually it requires a bribe to get you out. Now, in this case, it was the arbitrary brutality of the regime that led to this woman's death, but the whole episode is also symbolic of corruption. The same thing is true with the water and the irrigation projects running dry. The same thing is true with the unmitigated pollution um, and so forth. The answer to your question, though, is it's broader than just one institute. It's just morphed into the regime, whether it's the supreme leader, whether it is the Revolutionary Guard, whether it's this person or that person. There's been public pronouncements of um, exposures of corruption. Iran, Persian is one of the larging blogging languages. And unlike Arabs or um, um, Afghans, for example, when you do political polling, when we were there, it's a lot of snake oil. The contractors would ask them a lot of gamesmanship. They're just telling us what we want to hear or telling us something um, because they think they might get something from it. Iranians tend culturally to be much more cosmopolitan, and you can get much more of both a straight answer and criticism of the government. Um, the government has simply lost its legitimacy. The key point here, however, is years ago we did polling, where you take every telephone exchange in Tehran, you randomize the last four digits, so you get a good cross-section of neighborhoods. And you do a lot of economic questions. And like professional pollsters, you ask the same question multiple different ways. You do the statistical analysis, the number crunching. What you get at the time was 10% of the Iranian public really believed in the Islamic Revolution, the so-called hardliners principalists. Another 15% thought that the revolution was a good thing, but um, it's gone astray. 
it needs to be fixed. These are the so-called reformists. The other 75 percent were completely apathetic. They don't think the revolution could succeed. That doesn't mean they're revolutionary, because last time they had a revolution, they had a war that killed a million people. And so this is why the Iranian government hopes that they can maintain a zombie regime, because people are afraid of change. Um, but one other interesting factoid here is you've had a revival of Zoroastrianism inside Iran, um, which is, of course, the major pre-Islamic religion. If you guys know from the story of Jesus, the gift of the Magi, the Magi were Zoroastrian priests. At the same time, you've had a strong uptick in conversions to Christianity. I'm not talking about our Christianity, as the Iranians would say, the Syrian Orthodox, the Armenian Orthodox. I'm talking about more evangelical Christianity. Um, and that seems to be a blowback reaction to the association of the religious leadership with corruption. In fact, when it comes to ordinary Iranians describing their religion, I wouldn't say that they become unreligious. But they oftentimes talk about, in Persian, the word is dini khodiman, my personal religion, which they mean to differentiate themselves from the state-imposed religion. I'll try to be more succinct in future questions. Sorry. Is that answers your question, sir? Uh, yes, that, that's very well done. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the great question. And if not, we can the follow up afterwards. Answer. Of course. Yeah. yeah and another thing, just real quick. Uh, I forgot, it was mentioned Mujahideen Akhalq, right? again for the GPF forces who are not familiar. So they've been, as Dr. Rubin mentioned, fighting on the Iraqi side against Iranian government at the time. So when I was in Iraq with the U.S. Army, Ash, uh, uh, Camp Ash, Al Ashraf, that's where they were based uh, during Saddam Hussein, and then they were relocated, right, from Albania. Iraq somewhere. So that's, that was very radical oppositional kind of group. I believe they even were put on the t list of terrorists. They've been removed. Removed already. So that's, uh, that's about that. And uh, um, okay, so the next question. From the, uh, let's go to Facebook, and then we can go to the Arnold. To the Facebook, please. Right. Thanks, Dr. I. Uh, Elias Josefi from Oklahoma asks, what is the lingering impact of the 1953 coup d'etat on democratic aspirations of the current protest? Um, it's a great question. I would actually argue, first of all, this is a case of perception trumping reality. Because by the Iranian constitution, it was, actually wasn't Mossadegh who was in the right. It was Mossadegh who was supplanting the Iranian constitution. He wasn't the head of state. The head of state had the ability to dismiss parliament. It had been done many times before. Mossadegh refused to go. This is why at the time, if you read Kermit Roosevelt's memoirs of the time, and Kermit Roosevelt, of course, was one of the CIA officers who was instrumental in this operation, it was called the counter coup um, at the time. And if you look at the Shah's memoirs, uh, my answer to history, there's a chapter called The Red Versus the Black. The red were the socialists, the black were the religious authorities. And um, one of the ironies of this is that the current religious class in Iran were co-conspirators in that counter coup because they were afraid of the socialists at the time. Uh, one of the other ironies of history is remember the Americans along with the British and the Soviets had occupied a good channel, a good chunk of Iran during World War II to supply uh, a back channel trade route. And you'd think that the Iranians would be more upset by that physical occupation of their country than by what happened in 1953. Uh, the short answer is while it's become a major talking point in many progressive circles internationally and in terms of American self flagellation in um, our diplomatic uh, history. It doesn't seem to have as much resonance right now. Aside from what I would say, the, crown, the, the former crown prince of Iran, who realizes that after his father was restored in 1953, his father became much more dictatorial. And so you have an indirect reaction to that. Great. Thank you very much for the great answer. Now we're going back to the Arnold. Dr. Dastrand, please. Yes. Hi. My name is Dr. Kate Dahlstrand from uh, Army University Press. And I was wondering if you would be able to speak a little about if you have noticed or discerned any reactions 
from the Iranian government uh, to the way social media was used in the Arab Spring versus today. I feel like during, and this is just as a passive observer, yeah. of, observer I felt like during the Arab Spring, the Air, uh, Iranian government kind of lost the narrative at one point, and there was just a, a world of social media that had never been exploited like that before uh, on behalf of the protesters. And now it seems as if the Iranian government, there's two narratives. There's the protesting narrative, and Iran has somehow uh, recovered from the Arab Spring and is managing their own. Yeah. So uh, I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, great Appreciate questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, if anyone wants any clarification on anything I say, uh, on the slides, it had my contact information. I'm willing just to, um, to, to address questions that way as well. Um, the, the question basically was looking at the use of social media inside and the Iranian reaction to the use of social media, the creation of multiple narratives and so forth. Excellent question. It gets right to one of the fen uh, fundamental counter protest strategies. First of all, I can't resist but put on my historian cap. Uh, the Constitutional Revolution couldn't have happened without the telegraph. The Islamic Revolution couldn't have happened without audio cassettes and radio. Um, the Iranian government is very, very aware of its own history and very, very savvy at the need to try to control uh, communications. So too is the opposition. And so it always becomes a battle about whether the government is better at smothering fires than smothering embers than the opposition is at fanning the flames. Um, when it comes to social media, we see um, the Iranians have been very, very good, uh, and I have a book chapter on this for some other outlet and so forth and go into detail, but a few things. First of all, the Iranians started to get savvy on this in 1999 after the student uprising. I should say that also culturally speaking, Iran, Iranians tend to be much more per, um, permissive of technology than many of the other peoples around them. So it was less than a decade after we built a telegraph between Washington DC and Baltimore that the Iranians built a telegraph um, across Tehran. And likewise, while Saudi clerics were saying that television was the work of the devil. The Iranians were setting up television stations all over the place. Uh, and the same thing, the Iranians were the second country in the region after Israel to permit the internet. Um, what the Iranians have tried to do is slow down the internet at times of protest. Uh, but Iranians are, the government has tried to slow down the internet. The Iranians are very good at VPNs. The same thing has been with regard to control of satellite television. Um, one of the disadvantages, the advantage of having a huge bureaucracy is that you employ a lot of people so they're not on the streets and they're dependent on your regime. The disadvantage is when you try to have a pronouncement like um, no satellite television and when you have satellite dishes which have shrunk so that you can hide them, you know enough people in government that if you get caught with a satellite TV, you could have someone do the equivalent of fixing the ticket, like we might have once done in the old days. Um, and you might still do if you're in Chicago. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm from Philadelphia. I can't resist. Um, the, the point of this is the Iranians will cut the internet. It's a question whether they can cut the internet for very long. Um, one of the differences between Iran and Ukraine when it comes to a technology like Starlink is that Elon Musk could get Starlink up in Ukraine, aside from Crimea, because the Ukrainians were very permissive and were able to bring in, uh, were very willing to bring in the receivers and so forth. Getting the receivers into Iran is the difficulty. That said, you have certain areas like Dubai, which play it both ways. And the Iranians 
are limited in their ability to retaliate against Dubai itself, as opposed to the United Arab Emirates. Dubai being the city, United Arab Emirates being the country. Dubai is one of the Emirates in the United Arab Emirates. Because they have so, many tie, so much money tied up in Dubai that there's a limit to any sort of violent action they can take inside that city, um, city-state, without losing tens of billions of dollars. Um, other ways the Iranians are trying to crack down, if I may, in 1999, they learned that if they bash heads, that the reaction can be severe. So they've slowly gotten into facial recognition software. Instead of cracking heads or defenestrating students, you take their pictures, and then three weeks later, in the middle of the night, you arrest them. Now, you don't try to arrest everyone. It's psychological intimidation. What you do is you arrest someone. Maybe you give a few people now, they're doing this more, the death penalty, and you hang them publicly. Or Maybe you give them a 30-year sentence, but after six months, you let them out on a furlough. And someone who's been in Evin prison for six months, suffering this torture, this rape, male or women, it doesn't matter, um, abuse, doesn't come out the same person. You bring them out, they go home for the weekend, they get a nice home-cooked meal, grandma comes over, all their college friends and high school friends come over, and then at the end of that weekend, you have to go back to prison. And that's the way that Iranians will try to signal to the wider public that if you cross a line, this is what will happen to you. Instead of trying to punish absolutely everyone, you make a few examples, and then you give them these draconian sentences. You don't always carry them out so that they have the sort of Damocles hanging over their head. So you have the communications. Um, sorry, one other aspect, and I'm sorry to ramble on, and again, this is something which the Operational Environment Watch from Foreign Military Studies Office has covered. While on one hand, the Iranians will try to outlaw certain social media platforms like Twitter, back during 2018, during the economic unrest, it was actually kind of interesting that security agency affiliated accounts were trying to, were circulating pictures of people in the demonstrations and trying to crowdsource through Twitter the identification of some of the perpetrators they couldn't otherwise identify because their face was covered. And so this is also an acknowledgement that even when they outlaw certain platforms, that these platforms are extremely widespread and sort of like with a nod and a wink. I remember, again, and I'll end here, just about four months before the Syrian civil war broke out, I was in Damascus in, um, I think it was Farsusa, which is a neighborhood of um, Damascus, where the security agency is. And I was at an um, outdoor cafe, smoking shisha with friends, um, while um, a, a football game was on, a soccer game. And people were on their, um, their phones looking at their Facebook page, which was completely illegal. But this is in the heart of sort of the security establishment bubble inside Damascus at that time. Um, the official narrative versus what people do, even within official circles, are ver two very different things. Sorry, rambling answer to a question. Is that answers your question, Dr. Dasra? Yeah, great you. question, and as always, great answer. So we're going to, to the next question. Sir, please introduce yourself, ask your question, please in English. seconds or less, all the different themes that we talked about, social media, uh, nation state actors, but really, has there been a potential of political miscalculation within the region by these nation state actors influencing or playing this provincial kind of role play to antagonize these protests to the point where we're kind of backing the Republican Guard into a corner as they're developing nuclear weapons and potentially causing a regional instability? to the point we're going to draw in other nation state actors, US, Britain, and, and Russia themselves. Uh, I'm curious on your point of view or any studies of where this paradigm could actually be going. OK, uh, first of all, I'm not going to repeat the question because I see they turned your microphone on for the, the question itself. Um, for point number one, I haven't seen any indication of foreign elements being involved in the current protests. This was a spontaneous outbreak of, um, of unrest. Um, in fact, if anything, the um, 
outside force, especially Western elements, have been sitting on their hands so as not to feed the conspiracy theory that the West is involved. Now, separately, and this involves Iraq, but when I was in, um, in the Pentagon in the run-up to the Iraq War, uh, we had a parallel to this debate about whether we could support certain forces, um, whether it was wise or not, uh, both with regard to Iraq and with regard to Iran. And the, you could imagine at the time it broke down differently between the State Department, the CIA, the, um, the, the Defense Department, and so forth. But what the core of the argument was, does it really hurt, hurt to support other groups? Does it really stigmatize them if the regime they're fighting against is going to stigmatize them anyway with this claim? If we're so afraid of stigmatizing them, could the people that we're not giving assistance to, instead of creating an even playing field, could we put them at a disadvantage? Um, so I just want to highlight this because I'm sure that parallels to this continue to exist within the interagency process. Um, what the Iranians most say they need, by the way, would be strike funds. Um, so that, I mean, why is it that international labor will support labor movements all over the globe but won't give them in Iran? And then there you have the, issue, the same question with regard to the Greens in Europe, for example. Why is it you support environmental movements all over the world but not in Iran? Now, getting to the core of your question, though, which is backing the Revolutionary Guard into a corner. This is one of the, this is, I mean, the elephant in the room. First of all, if Iran develops nuclear weapons, it's not Iran's nuclear weapons program. The question is, who's going to have command, control, and custody of it? And so then you have the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, and while we've talked about the factional division within the Revolutionary Guard, you're likely going to have a special unit that has been particularly ideologically vetted for their, their, um, for their loyalty to the ideology. Then you get a situation where we tend to want to believe that revolutions can spin themselves out. But you have a self-fulfilling cycle of radicalization where when you have a succession, no successor, the Revolutionary Guard unit that has the custody over nuclear weapons isn't going to allow themselves to be subordinated to a new supreme leader that has a much more liberal or um, progressive worldview, internationalist worldview than they have. The policy issue right now is Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons yet. They just are developing the capability. So is there a time factor? I mean, are they North Korea yet or not? How did our discussions with regard to North Korea change? Um, this also goes into the factor of internal divisions within the Revolutionary Guard you're talking about them as a unit, but what happens if you have a situation like 1989 in Romania, where you have, um, I think it was in Timisoara, um, you have an uprising, but instead of crushing it, some of the security forces slowly join in. So by Christmas Day in Bucharest, you have um, Ceausescu, Nicolae, and Yelena uh, Ceausescu in front of the firing squad. Now, this also plays, that analogy plays a role in our calculations with regard, or regional calculations with regard to Iran. So, for example, oftentimes people who don't want the U.S. as involved will say the United States shouldn't get involved directly, and we should worry about pushing too far, even if Iran has nuclear weapons, because Iran isn't suicidal. They know that if they use those nuclear weapons, the laws of deterrence mean that they wouldn't end happily. I'd argue that's a straw man argument and that there's a problem with mutually assured destruction here. The issue isn't whether Iran is suicidal. The question then becomes whether they are terminally ill. So what if you have a, situ a scenario like 1989 in Romania and so 24 hours before you have Khamenei before the firing squad, or Ibrahim Raisi, the president, before the firing squad. What if you have that ideologically pure unit of the Revolutionary Guards decide that they're going to launch their weapons against Israel or Saudi Arabia? Are you really going to have regime, are, are you really going to retaliate with nuclear weapons? 
and gratuitously kill two or three million Iranians, because that's what deterrence in this case really is, if the regime has already fallen. And remember, when we look at the protests now, the protesters show, I mean, the enemy isn't Iran. The adversary is the Iranian regime. Now, back in the 2007 YouTube-CNN debate, the Democratic candidate debate, you had a question asked to then Senator Biden, Senator Obama, and Senator Clinton. And Senator Clinton said something to the effect of, if nuclear weapons are used by Iran, they would, uh, we, they would be obliterated. And both Biden and Obama threw a, ca I mean, threw a cautionary note into that, saying it was, ir I mean, they attacked Hillary, saying it was irresponsible of, that, of her to say that. That also goes to the psychological component of deterrence. Now, just in conclusion, as to this notion of foreign powers interfering, um, I would argue that you could be right, but that it's not realistic to believe that they won't interfere, especially because everyone's going to believe the other guy's interfering. Excellent uh, question and excellent. Is that answers your question, sir? Thank you so much Thanks. for the great answer. Uh, I think I saw a question. Dr. Killian, did you have a question? Please. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Rubin. I appreciate your comments. Uh, I found them very enlightening. This is a simple question, although it might not be easy. You showed us um, in the last slide all the books that you've written. So for someone wanting to get just a foundational understanding of the situation in Iran, which of your books would you recommend? First of all, I take the, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, perhaps I'm not a good Washington person, but I always take the attitude that I will never assign my books in class um, or, or cite them in answer to a question like this. Um, simply because there's a lot of good material out there and, and I don't like when other people do it. So the answer to your question, the one book I recommend people read if they want to get to an understanding of the Iranian mindset is a book that was actually written in 1985 by a professor who's at Harvard University called, named Roy Motahada. The book is called Mantle of the Prophet. And what it is, it's a narrative that it, it's the story of a three-year-old who starts in Quran school and rises through the ranks to become an Ayatollah. Now, when this was published, just a few years after the Islamic Revolution, um, Roy Motahada had said, it's not a real person, it's, it's, a, um, it's an amalgam. It actually was based on a real person. The reason why I like it is, first of all, it's a narrative. It lets you get the biggest problem I have with, pe with how I mean, professional military education is too often people can mirror image. This allows you to get inside the mind of an Ayatollah and to live their experience and how they got to their position. And at the same time, the book is filled with tangents about Islamic history, about Islamic philosophy, about Iranian history and so forth. So even though it was based in 19, uh, it was published in 1985 and it's been republished, that's the book I always recommend. Okay? Thank you so much. Is that answers your question, Dr. Killian? Great answer. Just for a piece of my own mind that uh, to make accessible to all our audiences, two more points were mentioned about Zoroastrianism. Uh, so just to make it clear, clarify that, Zoroastrianism in the pre-Islamic period uh, was uh, uh, common in the former uh, Persian Empire area, mostly India and Azerbaijan, both Azerbaijan, Iranian, and northern and other areas. So essentially, they were worshiping to fire, if that makes sense. And they had, like similar to Bible, Quran, like uh, Avesta, it was called Avesta. So it effectively means that was the first element of monotheistic religion, essentially. Although they were not like uh, worshiping to a single god. That's very interesting. Could go deeper, but we don't have time for it. It could be a different topic. And the second point was about 1935, uh, when Persia became, started to be called term as a Iran. So essentially, that came from the uh, 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 Iranian ambassador in Berlin, apparently under the influence of the German government. When the uh, Iranian uh, uh, ambassador say, suggested, of course, in, through the guidance from his government, that the term Iran 
and Persia could be used interchange interchangeably, is that my beautiful uh, uh, accent, interchangeably in the official documents. So that's where it came from, 1935. Does that make sense? Okay, so do, you, do we have any other questions from this audience? We have two more questions. I, I, if the audience is uh, willing to stay, we can, because we started a little later. Please, sir. The first question was, you, sir, go, go first, please. Mm -hmm. Major Bill Elder, uh, student at Command General Staff College. How is the history in Iran taught? So you talked about the revolutions and the history of those. Is that history repressed or modified in some way uh, that's impacting how Iranians today are going about the protest activities? Okay. Um, Thank you. The great question, it's about how history is taught in Iran. I can honestly commend you. It's not a question I've ever gotten before, but it's an excellent question because it matters in shaping perception. Um, back in 1999, I spoke at a conference marking the 90th anniversary of the Constitutional Revolution. They had picked 1909 as um, one of the key years there. And on one hand, I presented a pretty anodyne paper um, on the telegraph. On the other hand, I sat there as a historian wondering why the heck they were having this conference. And it seemed that their goal was to try to suggest that the root of the Constitutional Revolution was actually the ulama, the religious clergy as opposed to the liberal nationalists. So it was their way of trying to, um, if you will, hijack history. Now, when it comes to these specific protests, I have no way, I don't see anything in particular coming through. What I would say that Americans don't fully understand, I was asked before about the, ninth, uh, I guess online, about the 1953 counter coup, um, the brouhaha with Mohammed Mossadegh. If you flip the question as to what really causes anti-Americanism in Iran, um, it's multifaceted, and it comes into play with your uh, question. Number one is, and this extends to Iraq and some of the sensitivities that Iraqis have. It wasn't Mossadegh, but after, in the late 1950s, especially in the 1960s, you had a lot of American businesses come in, Pepsi-Cola, Bell helicopters, and so forth. And anyone working for those businesses had, had negotiated basically the equivalent of diplomatic immunity for themselves. So you've actually had a lot of cases in Iran in the 1960s of American drunk drivers who ran over a Persian kid, uh, smashed, caused property damage, and were just held immune, um, which caused a lot of resentment. At the same time, there was a very pop, the Islamic Revolution wasn't just Islamic, it was very leftist in its intellectual origins. There was a book that's been translated into English uh, by a guy named Jalal Ali Ahmed in the 1960s called, um, in Persian Garb Zadigi, that doesn't help you, called West Toxification, or Struck by the West. And it's basically this notion that all our faults come from the Shah having tilted, especially after 1961 to sort of this Western model. Uh, you can almost think of it as a secular equivalent of Said Koop's milestones from the Muslim Brotherhood, that if only we purify ourselves from these foreign influences, then we'd be better. But when it comes to these current protests, I'd say the key issue isn't how they're taught history, it's that the grass is always greener. That said, if the United States or any other country, and this goes to your question, sir, tries to insert themselves too, too um, directly that it's going to backfire because after, again, sorry to be a nerd, after first the Austro-Hungarians tried to do this, then the Belgians, then the Russian, the British, and the Germans, then the Americans, the last thing the Iranians want is for someone else to do this. And by the way, the Chinese are probably going to overstep their, their hands and you're going to see death to China rallies as well. Thank you very much, Theresa, to answer your question. Thank you for the great question and great answer. So just real quick about, uh, uh, you know, 1953, right? The key mm -hmm. was the nationalization of the oil industry 
in Iran, which Mossadegh was opposing, right? And uh, that caused a lot of uh, issues with the British, which are heavily yeah. invested in the oil industry, and that caused the subsequent events against Mossadegh in 53. And the Iranians so far very, very, very sensitive, suspicious yeah. about, about this. If, if, so, if I may, Mahir, just one more thing to add to your question. Again, I'm sorry. Um, when, when I lived there, um, I mean, I lived there for seven months, and one thing I noticed just in the publishing industry was you had a lot of translations of the biggest hits of Western literature into Persian. Even things like, I mean, you had War and Peace, but also things like Shel Silverstein's The Giving Tree. And um, the only difference was it began with, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Um, and you had, and I benefited from this as a scholar, you had a lot of archival historical research where they would just give photostats of the documents. And then, because I have trouble reading the old Persian handwriting, they would type the same document. And I could take it home so that when I got kicked out, and I eventually did, that I could still do my doctoral research. But what they didn't have is the sort of analytical history which we have in the United States. And when I asked a scholar about that, their response is, we know what, a uh, historian, we know what we're allowed to say today, but we don't know what we're allowed to say tomorrow. Therefore, we're going to be very careful about whatever literature we write, whether it's fiction or whether it's historical, um, to make sure that we don't put anything on paper which can be held against us 10 years from now. So it's created a very skewed um, manner of publishing inside Iran. Sorry, a little on the side. Thank you very much. So I think it's a, uh, we had w one more question, right? But I think it's a good time to wrap up the session. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rubin, for the great presentation. And thank everybody for the great engagement for the Arnold and our outstations. We really appreciate all of this great knowledge by the scholars like Dr. Rubin. We would like to acknowledge that. Thank you. So would you, would you like to have any final remarks? Thanks. Thank you okay. so much. Hopefully it was useful for everybody. Thank Thanks. you. Looking forward to seeing you next time.